Good morning, everybody. We have a change of scenery, so I'm at a new dining room table today. Um, but it's good to see you, even if it's virtually. Today is Pentecost. This is the last day of our annual journey through the life of Jesus. We have come from that period of anticipation before he was born, where people were waiting for God to keep his promises for him to be faithful through the life of Jesus, through his ministry and his death and his burial and his resurrection. Last week we talked about his ascension and what that means for us. And today is the day where he is reigning on his throne from heaven and he pours his spirit out on his people and then begins the process of sending them throughout all of the earth because at the end of the day, uh, he is not just the God of one particular people, but the God of all creation. And so let's begin today with a scripture reading from Acts chapter 2. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. They were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the sound, a crowd gathered, and they were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How can they teach, or how can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear them declaring the mighty works of God in their own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. And some asked each other, what does this mean? And others jeered at them, saying, they are full of new wine. And Peter looked with the other twelve, or stood with the other twelve, eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only nine in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. And even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs below on the earth, blood and fire and cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness. The moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When I was younger, um, I was thinking about this week, I kept saying when I was little, but this was when I was in high school even. I would read things like the prophecy from Joel that Peter talks about here in Acts chapter 2, and I would get scared, um, particularly in those years leading up to my decision to commit myself to Christ growing up in a culture that often was rooted in fear of hellfire and brimstone. Every time I would see a reddish-colored moon, every time I would think about a uh, an eclipse where the sun would turn black, every time I would read texts like this, I would be afraid. That's the point of the text, I would presume. Uh, blood and fire and clouds and sun being blotted out. All of these were signs of an angry God bent on judgment, coming to pour his wrath out on the world for those who were not smart enough to have been baptized for the remission of their sins. And of course, it doesn't take a genius to see that the world is broken or that it's a bad place. Uh, it's weeks like these and really months like these and really years like these uh, that causes one's heart to break again and again and again. And perhaps this year more than any year I've spent more time just simply praying, Lord have mercy than any other year. But imagine my surprise later when I went to preaching school and when I started studying the minor prophets like Joel 
and I began to realize that there was more to these prophecies than what I'd always presumed them to be. These were not first and foremost signs of an angry God pouring his wrath out on a sinful world. There was judgment involved, to be sure. God will set things right, to be sure. But more, these were the prophets putting into language something so enormous, something so earth-shattering, something so world-changing, that they struggled to find ways to express them. And so these events that Joel points to and the other prophets like him are not primarily about judgment, but about the world changing in fundamental ways. And that ought to have been obvious here in Acts chapter 2, because they're in the upper room on Pentecost, and the Spirit is poured out on them, and they begin to declare, the text says, the wonders of God. And they are doing so in such a way that all of those around them can understand what they're saying, even though they're from all over the earth and they speak all sorts of different languages, even though the ones speaking are uneducated Galilean fishermen and the such like that. And some presume that they're drunk. Peter says, we're not drunk, but this is what Joel was talking about. The Spirit is being poured out, and when the Spirit is poured out, signs and wonders will break out, not because God is angry and ready to judge the world, but because God is now doing something in the world to fix the world, to restore the world. Pentecost was a line in the sand. Pentecost was a day where everything changed, much like Easter Sunday was a day when everything changed. Pentecost was the next day in the development of God's story. And it was the day when his spirit was poured out, his spirit empowered those who follow Jesus. His spirit began his work in the world afresh and anew to bring about God's restoration and reconciliation. And this was something that was so new and so big and so enormous that people struggled to find ways to express the earth-shattering, world-changing scope of what was going on. And so they would draw on the poetic images of the prophets. And so it wasn't first and foremost judgment. God is angry. Here's his wrath. Be afraid. It was Everything is changing. The earth is shaking at its foundations. Nothing will ever be the same. Pentecost is one of those days. And sure enough, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit did a mighty work. Those Jews gathered from all over the world, and those people who had become Jews, even though they were born Gentiles from all over the world, and they worshiped God. And they realized when Peter was preaching, so many of them did, what was going on and they pledged their allegiance to Jesus. They received the Spirit. And then as the weeks went on and they stayed learning from the apostles, living into this new reality that Jesus would call his kingdom that we often refer to as church, the persecution came, and they scattered back throughout the world. And Jesus had said this was the way it was going to go, not necessarily the persecution, but this was the movement that the Spirit was going to make. It was going to start in Jerusalem, then go through all Judea, then Samaria, then the, the entire world. Because the God that they had come to worship on the day of Pentecost, the God that they had come to worship 50 days previous on the day of the Passover, the God that they had crucified on the day of the Passover, was not just the God of the Jews, not just the God of Jerusalem. That was too small of a thing. Not just the God of Judea. That was too small of a thing. Not just the God of the region. That was too small of a thing. He was the God of the entire cosmos. And he would not rest. He would be tenacious. He would keep going until the entire cosmos was brought back to him and all of its wounds were healed and all of its brokenness mended and all of its injustices were set right and so there is this beautiful this wonderful this awe-inspiring scope to what is going on in the book of acts when we talk about pentecost it's the beginning of a movement that not only shook the world in some metaphorical sense but it shook the world in a real tangible sort of way and we would do good to remember that we are here today, uh, here being wherever you are, sitting at your home, but talking about Jesus, sharing in the bread and the wine, even at a social distance, reading from his word, offering prayers to him because of what the Spirit did in the book of Acts. It all goes back to the Spirit moving at Pentecost. Without that, 
we, a bunch of Gentiles, wouldn't be there. And so the powerful of Pentecost is a powerful message. The message of power, Pentecost is a powerful message. But yet I can't help but look at the world. And this year's been one of those years. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. I can't help but look at the world and confess that every time I come to one of these high moments in the story of Jesus, whether it is uh, his crucifixion or his resurrection or his ascension or now the movement of the Spirit in our world, I have to come at it from an angle that I've never had to come at it before this year. Because I look out at our world and I see families grieving and I see communities burdened by the weight of injustice. I see cities burning. I see anger, which really comes from grief, broiling. And my heart simply breaks. And here in the book of Acts, we have, uh, at first glance, this uh, totalizing language. God is going to go to all of the world. God is going to go to all people. And I think on this Pentecost in particular, that we as a church, we've become good at that kind of language. Everybody matters to God. God loves everybody. God loves all people. There is room for all people in the kingdom of God. Everyone is welcome at our church. We use that sort of language often. All and everyone. And there is no one outside of the love of God. But it also strikes me on weeks like this and days like this that if we always limit ourselves to that sort of language, we never get down to the particular sacrifices the gospel asks us to make. It's easy enough to say, everyone is welcome. It's easy enough to say, it doesn't cost me anything to say, all people are loved by God. But those sentiments only take on meaning. Those sentiments only take on particular power when I can look a particular person, a particular group of people that are actually in my life, I can look them in the face and I can love them as someone made in the image of God. And isn't it interesting that the book of Acts starts with Acts chapter 2 and the Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost and the Spirit begins to move in such a way that he would take over all of the earth and God wants all of the people and God loves everyone and that's what Pentecost is about. But as the Spirit goes out into all of the world, he does so in very particular ways and the book of Acts is clear about this. It doesn't say that God loves all Ethiopians, but it tells the story of Philip talking to a particular Ethiopian. It doesn't say that God loves all the Gentiles, because God is one who loves all people, but it tells about Peter going to talk to a particular Gentile, Cornelius. We could talk about so many others, Lydia, for instance. And so the book of Acts is a story about the Spirit going into all of the world, but what I want us to wrestle with today, because we, we desperately need to see the people in front of us, is that the Spirit moves into all of the world through particular people with unique faces, with names, with stories, with a God who knows them personally and loves them uniquely and boundlessly. And he calls us as people of his spirit to join in that movement and to do the same sort of thing. And so we might think about it this way. Every Sunday we come together and at the end of our services, whether virtually or in person, we always say the same words. We recite the greatest commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one like it is this, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two are built all of the law and the prophets. And used to, when I started that practice years and years ago back in Texas, that's all we said. 
But there's always the lingering question when you read that text, unless you've thought about it before. The question that was asked, uh, the lawyer comes to Jesus, what is the greatest command? Jesus says, how do you answer? The lawyer gives him the same answer Jesus would have given. And then the lawyer asks, but who is my neighbor? In other words, it's easy to say, love your neighbors. God loves all of our neighbors, but the lawyer wanting to trick Jesus says, who is my neighbor? And you notice that Jesus doesn't tell there in the Gospel of Luke a story about some dude who lives next to some other dude. Uh, They share many of the same values. They drive the same sorts of cars. They have the same property tax rates. They um, share the same food, often over barbecue. Their lives have considerable amounts of overlap. That's usually what we think of when we think of neighbors. But Jesus doesn't tell a story about two people that are alike one another at all. He tells a story about a man who falls in the ditch and not one, but two people who were very much like him pass him by. And the third person who comes was the last person in the world that he wanted to see. He was nothing like him. He shared no values. There was very little common ground between the two. As a matter of fact, in their world, the Jewish man in the ditch and the Samaritan man riding along, seeing him who would offer him compassion, they would have harbored quite a bit of natural animosity toward one another. They have grown up in a world where they would have been considered enemies. And so the person who came along after the two that looked like the man in the ditch left him. He was the last sort of person that that guy would have wanted to see coming. But at the end of the day, it was his enemy that helped him. It was his enemy that showed him compassion, the one that he was supposed to be suspicious of, the one that was supposed to be so different from him, the one that he was supposed to hate. And so Jesus tells the story, and he asks the question, who was the neighbor in the situation? And the lawyer could only answer the one who showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. And the point that Jesus was driving is this. Go love God with everything you have and go love your neighbor. But who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells a story about two enemies learning to see one another as human. And um, what he's saying is until you can learn to see people like that, you don't have much of a claim for saying that you love God. As a matter of fact, that is why sometime later we added that second verse, the one from the end of 1 John 4 to the thing that we say at the end of every service. Uh, This is a new command we have from God that we should love one another. If anyone says that they love God but they hate their brother or sister, they are a liar, the truth is not in them. How can you say that you love God whom you have never seen if you can't love the one who is right in front of you who you can see? And so we have this command that whoever loves God ought to also love their brother or sister. It was John's way of saying the same thing Jesus was saying, that if you are going to claim to love God, you have to learn to claim love for the ones made in his image. Not some theoretical, categorical, all-encompassing, we love everybody or we welcome everybody, but to love the people in front of you. If you can't love the people in front of you who you see, John would say, you can't love God who you can't see. And Jesus would say the greatest command is to love God with everything you have, but the way you love God is to love the people that God made in his image. And if you can't love the people that God has made in his image, you don't love God. Dorothy Day said it like this, you love God just as much as you love the person you love the least. And I say all of that to say this, we live in a world now where we don't, see people. We see categories and we see groups and we see demographics and we are comfortable with saying they and those people and them over there and we desperately need to join with the Spirit who is still working in the world to see particular people. 
people who are flawed, people who are broken, people who are hurting, people who are grieving, people who get things right, people who get things wrong, people who do great things, people who do evil things. And usually all of these people are that one, all, uh, all of these things are present in that, that same person. But we have to learn to see people. And we have to learn to see God in those people. And we have to wrap our heads around the fact that if we're ever going to come to church and we're ever going to worship God and we're ever going to pray to him and we're ever going to read our Bibles and we're ever going to sing his praises and we're ever going to to listen to his word and it's ever going to mean anything as we gather at the table, we have to love those people. We have to pour ourselves out for those people. And until we can look our concrete individual neighbors with names and faces and stories and families and hurts and pains and pluses and minuses and successes and failures in the face and show them the love of Jesus, then we have no claim to love God. That's a high bar. And that's scary. And I could never do that on my own. But here's the thing. Today's Pentecost. Today's the day that God's Spirit was poured out and God's Spirit does things that we could never do by ourselves. So let's pray. Father, we ask you to fill us with your Spirit so that we can see others as you see them, so that our hearts will break at the things that break your heart so that we can rejoice at the things that cause you to rejoice so that we can see we can truly see our neighbors in front of us and having seen them father give us the courage to pour ourselves out for them to trust you enough to live our lives for them and so we come now and we praise your family our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever church let's remember who we are. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your might and your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two commands depend the whole of the law and the prophets. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This command we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also.